I, I kind of want to fin- finish up on this transmission and maybe talk a little bit about the transmission to here. We need to kind of put uh, Zen to rest where it went because Zen is in a number of places. We use the word Zen just because we're comfortable with it. It's a Japanese word. Uh, the first uh, monks of the meditation school that came to this country were Japanese monks. Um, Zen is in the lexicon Americana. You hear, you know, you're watching some dumb television show and they make reference to, oh, that's very Zen of you. Uh, yeah, America now has their perception of what that means. <laughs> Whether that has anything to do with anything, I'm not sure, but they certainly have a perception. Part of that perception is pretty good, actually, at least from the, the standpoint of the, the Japanese that came here. Um, it implies simplicity, and I think sometimes it implies clarity and peace, and, and that's good. If it's going to be used, that's a good way for it to be used. I know that 30 years ago, it implied paradox and funny stories and masters that historically had said things that nobody had any idea what they were talking about, but it was a pretty good story to retell, and people would sit around and chuckle about it. Well, we we have this transmission with Dogen, and we also have a, a transmission with Ese, who brings Rinzai. Uh, and technically a generation before Dogen, simply because he was that much older than Dogen. If we talk about generations being maybe 20 years and, and um, the way that it's usually talked about. So Rinzai really does arrive in Japan before Soto, but there are not Rinzai temples. So this is something like Japanese monks like to argue about. We don't need to argue about it because it doesn't matter. If we're talking a few decades of when the first dedicated Rinzai temple or the first dedicated Soto temple exist, in the span of time, it makes no difference when we're really looking at a history that's hundreds of years old. So Dogen's there, and one of the things we can say about Dogen is, is he had this made this enormous effort. Died young. Monks typically live a long, fruitful life. Uh, one of the things that they're missing... Uh, is stress. And that's, that's historically true all the way across the, the line. Uh, even in other religions, you find that, that monastics, for all the things people want to say about, um, perhaps that it's not natural and, and, uh, they pull away from the world and all of these kind of things, depending upon the, the monastic you're talking about, monastics tend to live a long time. Uh, life is simple. And one of the things that I've been trying to do more in my life is be on a schedule. And that is a key. The key is is going to bed at a time and getting up at a time. And it, it's not as critical as people think, how early you get up or how late you go to bed. It's that thing of having a rhythm in your life. Even if it's a tough rhythm, it becomes an established rhythm and your body gets used to it, your mind gets used to it. So Dogen went off and modeled... Um, a kind of practice that was very arduous, uh, very sparse, uh, very simple, very much like what, what we think of uh, in America when people say, well, that's very Zen of you. Uh, Dogen is the great exemplar in that um, life was kept simple. The monks going to these, and you have to realize that at least at this time, the practice of Buddhism is mostly a monk practice. And it's one of the things I'm conscious of when I talk is that, and sometimes people will go, well, what were the lay people doing? Well, they were bringing food to them and, you know, and clothing, and they were listening to Dharma talks on holidays and stuff like this, but mostly a Sangha with a big S practice. And the people were not participating a lot in what was going on. Um, that doesn't mean that people didn't go to temples and offer incense and ask for prayers to be read and all these other kind of things. They did. Um, but in Dogen's time, even though he taught laymen, in, in the last part of his life, he ended up out in the middle of nowhere on the side of a mountain, on the side of a canyon, um, teaching monks, living a very, very simple life. And, and these monks typically, even today, when they go to the monastery, they don't take much with them. 
I've tried encouraging that here when people have decided that they wanted to be a monk or a priest. But there's the early days are the days of living in a monastery with three robes. Um, you have a set of clothes to work in. You have a set of clothes for the summer. You have a set of clothes for the winter. Laundry is done twice a week. Everything you own is in the zendo. And so it, it causes things to be very, very simple. And later on, people can leave that monastic situation and start accumulating goods. But hopefully, when they start accumulating things, the goods don't own them anymore. They, they might own something extra, but they, they know they own something extra because of limited space. It, it's a real interesting thing. You can tell people, well, you've got, you've got this closet, but don't fill it. But when you give people a little box at the end of their sitting platform and say, and a shelf and say, that's your space, they, um, it, it automatically limits what they can have. So now it, it becomes very practical. And, uh, of course, the monks did all the repairing of their own robes. On the calendar, on the monk's calendar, there's a day in the month where they can sew their robes back up because they stepped on them and tore them or whatever took place. And most of those robes that they wear in the monastery, by the time they get out, they're totally trashed because they have been wearing them constantly. And they've been eating in them. And, you know, it's just almost impossible. And all the time this is going on, their teacher is telling them to take care of these robes, to absolutely take care of these robes, because they should treat them like their eyes, because that's what Dogen said about the the Buddha's robes, is you would treat them as you would your eyesight. So it's a wonderful lesson for them, because it's a lesson in simplicity, that they get used to having very little. Kind of like what we used to see when... when, um, People from the Peace Corps were coming back after spending a couple of years in a foreign country, and they were no longer in the clothes. They, it, you know, they didn't need a lot. They had, uh, uh, they were overwhelmed by how much money that they could now make when they went to work, and there was a real adjustment period for them because uh, it didn't, it, it just didn't matter anymore. They were living with people that there was no such thing as fashion. Well, that's one of the things monks are supposed to get over. When you're living with a bunch of people that are wearing exactly what you're wearing, okay, there's two lessons in there. One, you don't get to be different. And two, you have to prize what you have. No matter how simple it is, how humble it is, how old it is, how worn it is, you still have to prize it because it's all you've got. And you start to understand how valuable even a raggedy old robe is. Because you don't get to go to the chanting hall or the meditation hall unless you have this raggedy robe that you keep repairing and putting back together.